This is Pokemon Legends Neo, Getsis, and the name is a mouthful on purpose because our goal here is dreaming up what a Pokemon game could look like if they were ever to make a T-rated action-based JRPG in this day and age. So things will be edgier, but not too edgy, hopefully. And I'm wanting to bring in quite a few T-rated JRPG tropes as well as you'll see throughout this series. But first, videos with as much art and effects as the ones in this series are pricey, so we are very thankful to today's sponsor, Magic Spoon. Cereal is one of those nostalgic foods that always brightens my day when I have it, but now as a health-conscious type 1 diabetic adult, most cereal is just sugar with some processed grains thrown in it. It's all just fattening carbs. Two protein, 34 carbohydrates! Whereas... Whereas Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four to five net carbs in each serving, totaling only 140 calories. It's like a protein bar in the form of cereal. It's soy-free, grain-free, gluten-free, and of course, keto-friendly. I lost an entire human's worth of weight on keto, and I loved Magic Spoon throughout it. My favorite sponsors are the ones I use regularly, which is the case here. This is the variety pack they sent me to show you. It's got their most popular flavors, and this is what I've bought myself because I love it. I've eaten these all already, and I only kept one box of each flavor. There was much more than this. And every time I ordered, I used the link in the description, magicspoon.com slash Loxton, and used the code Loxton to get $5 off of the order, and now you can too. Worry-free, because there's a money-back guarantee. My favorite flavors are cinnamon, blueberry, and frosted is a close third. So big thanks again to Magic Spoon. And now on to the future. I'm making a mess. My name is Auburn, grandson of a legend, the Kanto Champion Red, who gave his life defending this place from the Cataclysm 40 years ago. So I never met him, but they tell me he took the lead on the front line, commanding 18 legendary titans around the border, keeping rabid Pokémon back from the city while refugees from all over the world came in their masses. Kanto was apparently one of the last regions hit, which gave us the time to build a new protective dome around what would become known as Neo Kanto City. I just call it Neo K. Most of us born here do. And while I had little choice in the matter, following in my grandfather's footsteps, I now work as a guard with my partner Pokemon Drill. When a guard first enters training, they are given three options for partner Pokémon. The three vary because beginner-friendly non-rabid Pokémon are a rarity these days. But when Auburn began, his options were a Snivy, a Thurple, and a Dreel. Each specializes in different styles of combat or classes, per se. Thurple, as it evolves, is excellent when it comes to speed and mobility on land, and at causing damage over time effects at close and medium ranges. Snivy, as it evolves, can trap other Pokémon, heal, and does really well with melee attacks. And Drill is a fun mix, allowing quick water traversal, as well as great at dealing up-close area-of-effect damage, as well as long-distance snipe-like attacks. The name Drill combines Drill with Eel as they spin their spade-like tails to dig down into the earth for protection. They are like little baby sand eels or garden eels, and its determined eyebrows and pompadour-like head fin shows off its attitude. It's ready to go with just a hint of prankstery meanness. They'd like to rapidly pop out of the ground and scare others. And by giving it this very defined personality, it helps differ all three of these starter Pokémon. You got a snobby Chillo, a scared and skittish, and a determined little punk. Also, all three of them are snake-like. I wonder what that's about. Anyway, Drill eventually evolves into Bore, a moray eel that bores into the earth. It carries a hunk of seafloor with it that it has shaped into a mine borer, which is modern mine digging machinery. It's also mastered the power of the ground, adding ground type to its previous mono water. Eels of all kinds prefer living in crevices and small caves, and plenty dig them out themselves. And their mean looking teeth and preference for seclusion has given them a dark reputation, and they are often shown in media as big ol' meanies, even if they are just kinda long sea puppies. Bore is just a bit grumpy though, it needs its beauty sleep. And it's nocturnal, it makes beauty sleep kinda hard. When fully evolved, thanks to all that beauty sleep, it becomes Tsunagi. 
combining the Japanese word for eel, unagi, with tsunami, those massively destructive waves that are caused by oceanic earthquakes. In fact, its signature move is called tsunami. It's essentially the move surf in every way, but it also scatters stealth rocks all around as it dealt a lot of damage to the ground. Tsunagi uses its incredibly powerful tail to burrow into the earth and launch back out at incredible speeds, dealing massive damage to its prey. It's grown leg-like front fins and a more eastern draconic looking face. It's akin to the Japanese dragon eel, as well as the eastern association between dragons and the ocean. It's also like a big ol' sea serpent monster, or Cetus, a classic sea monster. And its main attacks are, of course, earthquakes and highly accurate shots of water. Hey! Morning, Auburn! This is Tida, Auburn's neighbor and one of the managers at Carp Incorporated, the Magikarp fishery. He insists everyone calls him boss, but he's just one of the managers. And he's tired all the time from his job helping the schools of Magikarp move with the tides. Hence his name, which also literally means lazy person in Japanese. Those e-sticks are gonna wreck your lungs, man. Yeah, what a great way to greet your uncle, huh? He's also been selectively breeding Magikarp to evolve them into a much more docile, smaller, and nutritionally compact Gyarados. As a result, Neo Gyarados is much sleeker, mono water type, and they all come in red. There isn't much space in the ocean inside of Neo Kanto City's protective dome, and the waters outside are far too dangerous for a fishery, so the more densely packed they can keep their fishery, the better. There's more than 90 million people to feed, after all. Hey, so you know, avoid cans of Gyarados for a while. They've got some shrapnel contaminants in them, but you didn't hear it from me. The last thing I need is some agents knocking on my door talking about a leak. This is Moncuar, a particularly strange or queer conglomeration of plants, a monstera, a kala lily, and a Japanese aukuba, just to name a few. It has spots all over its leaves, which resembles the speckly variegation that many houseplants are especially bred to have. They have a big job here in Neo Kanto City. Acting as someone who passes out flyers or a tissue pack marketer, a somewhat unique aspect of Tokyo. You'll often find people out in front of businesses whose whole job is to advertise the business by handing out free tissues and flyers, and many of these flyers have QR codes on them already. That way you can scan them with your phone and they'll take you to the business's website. And the spots on some of these plant leaves looks like it could be made to resemble some QR code. But MonQR here is able to alter its own plant cells, creating darker spots and is able to change the QR code as needed for different businesses. It takes a lot of energy and it's hard work, but they love showing off their hard work. They show it off the same way one would show off their fancy new manicure, and they also love compliments, but always shy away and smile behind their mask, which resembles the variegation of Monstera. It is a very flamboyant plant mon, always doing the limp wrist thing because it's fabulous. Over-the-top characters like this always find themselves in JRPGs, often egregiously and not too well thought out, but uh, in doing a T-rated action JRPG Pokémon concept, it had to be referenced in a new mon somehow. Uh, so here it is! Reporting for duty, Captain. Good. I'd like you to meet up with Sam and deal with a disturbance at the Stone's residence. Uh, is it the primate again? Throughout Neo Kanto City, Neo primate are a bit of a problem. Without any real caves or trees to call home, they became even more furious, and substituted their lack of trees by swinging on electrical poles and cables. Eventually, they learned how to harness the electricity and started repeatedly shocking themselves with it. With this shock, they can fuel their fire, their rage, their passion for power. Now fighting electric type, their signature ability Jolted causes them to take some damage whenever they use an electric type attack. However, it also will always raise either their speed or attack stat. Throughout the city, they are known to find open circuits or create their own by tearing cables apart and putting that cable on their arm, shocking themselves sometimes even stealing the copper inside because it looks pretty. It puts them in an angry, high-like state, and once they are done with their rampage, oh, they calm down hard and fall asleep instantly. 
Yeah, yeah, this is a hard drug reference. Druggies, arm, yeah, it's stealing the copper out of your walls. The primate here have done this so much that their bulging veins now resemble electrical wires, and their fur is now even more out in all directions due to static electricity. And its face now more closely resembles a baboon or mandrill, incredibly strong and irritable monkeys with huge fangs. And primate's eyes are inside of what is a baboon face, mandrill face, nose thing. It gives it that crazy eye look! And here those fangs stick out like warthog tusks, which are also incredibly sturdy and tough animals. And people did always say Primeape had a pig nose, even though it's pretty reminiscent of plenty of apes and monkeys too. No Primeapes, but I should emphasize this is THE Stone's residence. Y yes we got this call in this morning! the ruffians indeed, Neo Smeargle and its new evolution Rafiti are known to make messes all over Neo K, marking their territory with brightly colored paint like goo. Regular Smeargle did this as well, but the more polluted environment has affected its sensitive paint, making its chemical composition now poisonous to inhale. Eventually leading to Smeargle developing this form as a poison type, and its attitude started to shift as well, making it poison dark type. No cyberpunk city is complete without graffiti everywhere, and you always see gangs of hoodlums with their beanie hats and baggy pants. So what better dog breed to add into the beagle that is Smeargle than a Sharpei? Those Chinese dogs that are so, so wrinkly with their baggy skin, it looks like it almost covers their eyes half the time, which is referenced with Rafiti's face, which also has a big snout, tongue sticking out, and it's carrying a bone that makes it resemble the masks that spray painters wear. And look, it's even got hoodie strings. Like Smeargle, it only knows the move Sketch, which permanently copies almost any move it just witnessed, like a painter taking in a scene and putting it on a canvas. So how do you evolve that? Just make them on stats better? Well, yeah, Smeargle was always a little on the weak side, but also it's got the poison touch ability on top of that now. Like lead paint, you better not lick your fingers after scratching it. Plus now it's immune to psychic type attacks and gets the stab bonus with poison and dark type moves instead of just boring old normal. But hey, it's not the only graffiti inspired mon here either. Neo K is a mega metropolis after all. There's bound to be lots of it. And maybe the citizens walk by these all the time and never notice it, especially in the several floors of underground living space. This mon does a really good job blending into the background of highly tagged walls. This is Gramelion. This gremlin of a chameleon is only a few grams in weight, as the only thing this ghost poison type Lockemon has in terms of a physical body are the paint particles it possesses. It can appear completely two-dimensional when flattened against a wall, and can change its colors at will. It hides in plain sight amongst the street art, watching pedestrians walk by until it spots a target to follow home. Or a target to just jump out of the wall and terrify. Doing so does make it dizzy, however. Swapping between being two and three-dimensional does that to you. Along with the chameleon aspect, it's also inspired by the Keokigen, a yokai which resembles a long ball of hair, hence Gramelion's fuzzy body. The Keokigen's name means an unusual thing which is rarely seen. They live in dark and damp places and will follow people into their homes and make them sick with disease which is where Gramelion's poison type comes into play. If a Gramelion makes your home its own home for too long, you'll start having respiratory problems, difficulty breathing, and coughing fits. But really, this is just a reference to poor housing conditions in general. Mold, mildew, a cold draft, all things blamed on ghosts, gremlins, and yokai back in the day. And all things many of those in Neo Kanto City have to deal with. 
After all, the area's population suddenly grew 20-fold in the span of a few weeks when the cataclysm hit 40 years ago, as refugees rushed in. New buildings and an entire multi-story underground layer upon layer of city were built. And not all of them up to code. Desperate times, desperate measures, and all that. And decades later, these buildings are falling apart. Letting crummy Gremelians in from outside. Yeah, good job, Drill. Now let's go help Sam with the other side. Oh. Oh, that's a lot of stickers. Oh, hey, hun. Here to help? No. We'll find the culprit under one of these. Just be careful not to damage the walls. Uh, oh. Drill there! Okay, so I love sticker bombing, actually. This is one of my shelves. But when done to public property, it is considered a form of vandalism or graffiti as well, which of course is rampant across megacities. Stick It Here is a tiny little fairy ghost type guy who steals and collects stickers it finds everywhere. It uses them to accessorize and decorate itself, and it too hides in plain sight amongst its collections. They have many, many variations and forms, though the changes are merely aesthetic, just like the many different furfru trims. They are based on generic sprites, fairies, spirits, dust bunnies, susuatari, dokebi, donde, tro, you name it. Tiny spirits that steal things and like to cause mischief in your house and out in the woods. But also do everything they possibly can not to be seen. Which is why Stick It steals stickers. And it will take a sticker and stick it to itself, the little buggers. <sighs> Alright, how many was that? 40 to 50? Easy. But we took care of them good. Yo, who's gonna help me clean up this mess? This mess! Ah! So hey, you excited? I hear it's your first solo scout mission this week. Yeah, they want me to check out this place called the Lake of Rage. Just routine water parameter stuff though. A little danger. Uh-huh. A little danger is what they told me too on our first solo outing. Yo! I barely made it out of there alive after the attack of the Horde of Tyranitar. Apparently there's supposed to be a solitary Pokemon, but there's easily a dozen of them together. I only survived because of this little guy's healing abilities. Snow? This is Snagooey! Quite the Sugoi sea slug. Sugoi is a Japanese word that can be used in quite a few different ways. In this case, it's very good. It gets excited, it's cute, and its gooey little body is said to feel and smell like flan. It even burps up sticky, caramelly stomach acid to digest its food before it slurps it up. After all, it mainly eats algae and corals, and corals are kinda hard. Wouldn't be good to be all rummaging around in its gut all the time, so it's gotta turn the coral into goo first. But of course, its body being as soft and gooey as it is, has led it to develop a number of defensive strategies. For instance, its poison is entirely defensive, and it uses its brightly colored back as a warning signal for other Pokémon not to touch it, lest they get badly poisoned. Or at least that's what it wants you to think. There are sea slugs in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but being brightly colored as a warning for their toxicity is a lie a lot of the time. There are many who are toxic, but there are also many copycat sea slugs that look the part to warn off predators, but they are not actually poisonous. And plus, Plus, many of these sea slugs look like they are carrying around little blankets already, too. So, when under threat, Snogui gets all snuggly in its back. It's like a security blanket that makes other Pokémon think they'll get poisoned if they eat it. Though, of course, if the Pokémon or its trainer is smart enough to know that it's not toxic, the blanket doesn't really provide much real defense. It's a soft blanket, and it's just part of its regular body. It's just like the security blankets little kids carry around to protect themselves from monsters. And also, it's just there to be comforting. But that's also why its name sounds like baby speak for Snuggly. It's Snuggly! Snuggly! Where it fails at defense, though, it excels in HP and healing. Sea slugs can go six months without any food at all and recover just fine, and they can get fully decapitated, heart and all gone. 
and regrow their entire body from their heads. So Snagui's ability, Regenerative, boosts the healing it receives from any source by 20%. And of course, it learns plenty of healing and even a few drain moves. Its signature move, though, Healing Goo, is essentially floral healing. It can target allies and heal them for 50% of their max HP. The goo it burps up may be acidic, but the slimy goo all over its body is full of healy, healy goodness. Sugoi! Just be careful, hon. I like you. We make a good team. And don't worry about this mission. I'll write it up. See you next time, Obby. A little danger, huh? I guess we'll see.